What do you want to be when you grow up? Imagine a world where everyone was free to explore their potential without constraint and without hesitation. A world where every person knew what they wanted to do in life. As a 10-year-old, that was exactly how I thought the world would be, but it took quite a process for me to figure out that there's a lot more to it. My name is Rehan Maritra Indrayanto, and I'm currently a psychiatry resident training at one of Indonesia's top teaching hospitals. My talk, though, won't be about any new groundbreaking research regarding mental health, nor will I be giving out tips or tricks for living a mentally stable life, not in this talk anyway. What I'd like to discuss is something which is a bit more personal that, in all honesty, rarely have I ever opened up about, especially in public. I've lived over half of my life in Indonesia, being spent in a number of different cities, high school in Bandung, medical school in Jogja, and finally deciding to settle in Jakarta, where I currently live with my wife. The first part of my life is where this story begins. So having moved to Manchester, UK, at the young age of only two years, the earliest memories that I can think of are those of cold British weather, fish and chips, and school. That's right, school, like most of us, then was that place that we all had to go to. But I completely loved it. I remember spending time in class being taught lessons that left me feeling of it as if I learned something super important every single time. And that definitely sparked up an inner curiosity in me that a primary school student should have. I dreamt of becoming an entrepreneur, a scientist, a writer. Back then, it was as if the road would just show itself as I walked on. Or at least that's how I thought it would be. Little did I realize it wouldn't be at all that easy, but in retrospect, I still had it lucky. After finishing primary school, I moved back to Indonesia with my parents and my sister. And sooner than I realized, I was already starting secondary school at a school that I'd only learned about, in a city that I only had faint memories of, and in a country where I didn't know how to speak the language or know much about the culture. As you can imagine, it was quite difficult. Transitioning from primary to secondary school on its own is often quite challenging. More so as I had to keep up with the new school system, which was completely different to what I experienced in the past, and do it while trying to make out what everyone was trying to say. Things took quite a plunge rather quickly, and I remember getting back my report cards, and they had red numbers on them, which, you know, is never good news. I fell right to the back of the class, both figuratively and literally, as being labeled as nothing much had me losing belief in myself and eventually in the things around me. I began to lose that spark that was once there, and I ended up choosing to sit right at the back of the class, going through school as if it was just something that I had to do. Now, as I understand from theories of human development, the teenage years are often the most crucial periods in life for identity development. And looking back, I may have unwittingly identified myself as being unworthy and accepted that role as being that kid who just never gets good grades, who will never amount to much. It would be naive, though, to just blame all of this on moving to another country, as there surely is more to it, with many different factors playing role. Others being put through the exact same situation may end up with completely different experiences, where some may even excel. But through my experience, I'd like to offer anyone having to deal with similar feelings of discouragement and apathy, this next part of my story. So I arrived on my final year of high school, stuck at a crossroad of having to decide where in the world I wanted to study. Now, back then, I had no idea whatsoever what I wanted to do with my life after finishing high school, let alone having to select a place to study. 
It was as if that primary school fire had turned into a mild flame, ready to be put out at any given moment. But then, as I'd mentioned before, I got lucky. During this crucial period in my life, my homeroom teacher contacted my parents to discuss this urgent matter. And as I later found out through all of my self-doubting, my self-labeling, which had constructed a distorted self-view, there turned out to be someone who believed in me, and that was my teacher. Together with my parents, they helped open my eyes to a world that was always there, but was never in sight. They guided me to discover a multitude of different careers, professions, jobs, and ways of living without pushing any of their own personal agendas. I was free to explore my own interests and opportunities, and I was nearing finding the answer of what I wanted to become. It was quite a confusing experience, to say the least, but no doubt a life-changing one. I soon realized that it wasn't really what I wanted to become, but rather what I wished to pursue in life. And the solution coming not from the career options being handed to me, but from the way in which my motivation was cultivated. I began questioning why I do the things that I do. What reason is there for me to go to school day after day, studying things I had no interest in? Was it just to avoid punishment or negative social consequences? How about if now I had a clear vision in front of me and I had purpose behind the things that I do? This changed me drastically and over time, I began to feel again that long lost spark that was once there. It grew inside and influenced how I perceived my life and how I perceived myself. It helped me persevere through my final year of high school and to run over negative comments from peers or teachers that didn't believe in me. And now looking back, I understand that adolescence can very much be a difficult time in life. It's a phase in which change happens quickly and where transformation in physical, social, and mental identity takes place, constantly evolving, modifying, reshaping. It's a period in a young person's life where they get to choose what sort of person they want to be. Choose as it should be one's own autonomy to select the sort of life to be lived. And sometimes a nudge from someone who's been there can make that process a whole lot easier. In no way is my story or experience meant to become a success story. And I don't think that's even the purpose or point of this talk. What I'd like to highlight is how even a small gesture of having hope and belief in someone's potential has the ability to jumpstart their inner gear, causing motion that might make them end up somewhere that was completely different to what was initially expected from anyone else. And my story is for anyone out there dealing with feelings of self-doubt and untrue self-labeling. Life isn't always going to turn out the way we want it to be. And there may be times we can get lost. But getting back on track will require an inner fire, a fire capable of moving us to discover new abilities recover lost ones, and to find meaning and purpose. Having someone believe in you might just be that catalyst for you to regain back that fire. I was fortunate enough to have been surrounded by people who believed in me and who was there to help me get through these difficult times. But others may not be as fortunate. 
understand that every single one of us has the power to change not only our own lives, but of those around us. Whether being a friend, a classmate, a parent, or a teacher, being perceptive of those in your life, those you meet and interact with on a daily basis can mean so much. Having the courage to lift up those around you in need of help can be so empowering and it conveys a strong message of how helping one another can literally change lives. And motivation by helping someone, by giving a helping hand. That can also evoke strong motivation, intrinsic motivation or motivation coming from within that requires an understanding of what has to be reached and what wants to be reached. And as long as we have that view, we have that vision set in our minds for whatever it is we want to achieve in life, motivation will be that fuel that drives us forward. I am nowhere near my finish line, and I don't think any one of us knows where that is, right? And where I am right now may not even be my end game. This might just be a stepping stone for future ventures unknown yet to this 26 year old mind. But even if we don't know where we'd end up in 10, 20, or even 50 years time, whether or not we'll stay on the same track or end up creating new ones, know that motivation will be that thing keeping us going. So for any students out there currently dealing with feelings of self-doubt, I ask and I invite you to view your life as if it were a marathon, with the finish line being far out of reach, but within close proximity up here and in here. Everyone's marathon track is separate and that's completely fine. What's important is knowing that every fall and tumble is part of the journey. We can always get back up and continue on. And helping those around you, that can also be of great importance as it provides second chances to those who might not have otherwise received them. And to all teachers and parents out there, I ask that we start assisting our children to explore their potential and to help them find meaning in their lives. I urge that we act as collaborators to help them find that fire, to help them find that motivation, and to help them find and reach their truest potential. Understand that everyone, every one of us has it in us. All we need is support and a helping hand from time to time. Thank you.